Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome, and thank you so much for coming out on another beautiful spring evening here in Minnesota. I'm Patrick Thomas, the Managing Director at Milkweed Editions, and um, I'm going to start off with a very brief set of thanks. Um, first of all, thanks to you all for coming here tonight. Um, thank you to all the generous funders that uh, uh, allow Milkweed to do what it does. Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention one of our largest funders, uh, the Minnesota State's State Arts Board, um, which comes to us thanks to a legislative appropriation um, from the uh, Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and a grant from the Wells Fargo Foundation of Minnesota. Uh, we feel very fortunate to have their support and the support of the numerous amazingly generous foundations here in town. Yeah, let's clap for that. <clears throat> We're also very fortunate to have an organization like uh, Fresh Energy uh, co-sponsoring the event tonight. Um, not only as our co-sponsor, but also as an organization that is uh, ensuring a livable future for all of us. So thank you to Michael Noble for joining us and uh, for the organization to help out. And Michael's going to introduce Don and Sean uh, briefly here, so I don't want to steal his thunder at all, but I do want to say a thank you to Don Shelby. It's amazing to have you here tonight. Um, and then also a huge thanks to Sean Otto. Uh, we've been working with Sean on this book for a little bit over a year and a half now, um, and the amount of energy, the amount of intelligence, the amount of passion that's been poured into this project is truly impossible for me to describe to you all tonight. Um, it's an inspiration to be able to work with him, and uh, I think it's a really vitally important project that he's bringing to the world. So thank you, Sean. Thank you. That, Michael. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I'm Michael Noble, and I'm the executive director of Fresh Energy. Uh, this tonight is all uh, Sean Otto night, so, uh, but he's invited me to say a few words about our organization and especially why this book is so important to us. Uh, first of all, our organization is now 25 years old, and uh, Fresh Energy has been working to shape and drive our public policy in the area of energy and climate change uh, since uh, 1992. And so we're the folks at the Public Utilities Commission with the data and the science. We're the, po the folks at the state capitol uh, laying out the arguments the future that's less dependent on oil and less dependent on coal and less dependent on natural gas and transitioning over to efficiency and transitioning to solar power, transitioning to wind energy and electric cars and public transportation and biking and walking and better communities. So the reason that uh, I was, I think, invited to uh, 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 at least make some introductory remarks is that um, you know our work is uh, greatly affected by uh, the subject of this book. And I've been tracking at least one of the topics that's pretty well covered in this book, the war on climate science, really most of my professional career. I think I started a manila folder back in 1992, and I think I actually called it war on climate, uh, keeping track of all the assaults on uh, climate climate change and climate science and the integrity of the scientists that were trying to lay out the seriousness of this problem. And the fact that uh, 20 years later, you know, the man on the street, the person on the street, the average person on the street is asked what they know about the climate and they often say, well, on one hand and well, on the other hand. And it's because there's been an all-out effort to throw sand in the gears of science and throw sand in the eyes of the public about the science. And this is just eminently well documented in this book. I, uh, literally, uh, in Minnesota, going back to 1995, these, these contrarian anti-science uh, folks trying to manipulate the public understanding have been active and uh, it's all over the world that this is happening but it's mostly a phenomenon of, of, of the American political system. And I want to tell a brief uh, personal story, very very brief personal story that I, I, I just want to make a public confession of this. In uh, 2009, this is well documented in the book, in 2009 in late November I was getting ready to go to the Copenhagen Climate Conference which was a catastrophic failure making progress on internationally on climate conference in Paris was a smashing success and I was preparing to go and it was Thanksgiving weekend and I remember I was with my family in Chicago and um, the conference was supposed to start about uh, seven or eight days later and I remember reading in the Chicago Tribune 
that uh, a, a thousand emails, uh, uh, correspondence between climate scientists all over the world had been stolen from a server in East Anglia, England, and had been put on a Russian website, uh, uh, and then the, the links to the emails were all put on the website of uh, climate denial organizations run by fossil fuel interests all over the world. And I remember thinking, wow, that's sort of weird, a thousand emails. And there were six or seven phrases. I mean, I imagine myself, I have a thousand of my emails stolen. I mean, six or seven phrases wound up in papers all over the world for the next four or five days. And what it served to do is make people, average people who didn't know what was going on, wonder, what's with these climate scientists? These emails are sort of nasty. Or, you know, I wonder what that phrase means. I wonder what this phrase means. And my public apology is that I didn't say anything because I was like, wow, I haven't read all thousand emails. I don't really know what's in them. I wonder what these scientists are saying to each other. But what was happening is it was an all-out assault on the very foundation of intellectual inquiry and scientific reason just 10 days before the world 192 nations were gathering in Copenhagen to talk about what we're going to do about the problem. It was an all-out effort to make the public think, well, maybe there's something suspect about the science. Well, I had already been studying this for 20 years. I knew the science was rock solid. I knew the science was good. I knew what was going on, but I didn't know what was in these thousand emails. So two, days, two, two years later, it took me to write a, a blog post I called an apology to all the climate scientists that I did not speak up. That I just went to the Copenhagen conference and I forgot about the emails, but they were hanging over the whole conference like a big, heavy, wet shroud. Because people were saying, well, what's going on with these emails? Well, the truth is, is that over those two-year period that I was silent, nine different inquiries showed that there was nothing in the emails. That there was just science. It was just scientists talking about science. It's all that was in the emails. There was nothing in the emails. There wasn't one single shred of the foundation of science that had been gathered over 50 years. Not one single brick was taken out of the edifice of the science. But what happened over those two years is people ask, well, what the heck is going on with these climate emails? So it is truly a war on science. You know, it's a strong title for a book, but it is an all-out war on science and reason. And the foundation of civilization is science and reason. So I want to just say again how incredibly proud I am just to be able to welcome and introduce these, these two really, really remarkable Minnesotans. Late uh, Daniel Patrick M Moynihan is famous for saying, I, I don't know if it's exactly quoted right, but everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. <laughs> I mean, in order to have a debate, a public policy debate, or a debate about the future of any technical question, or policy question, or engineering question, or scientific question, don't we just actually have to agree on a basic set of facts? Don't the factual plain facts of the matter have to be the foundation of the debate. So that's what I think why that this think is is why I think this is an enormously important book at an enormously important time laying out the questions that the facts do matter and that science is the foundation of reason and that reason is the foundation of a civilized society. So I'm very, very honored to, to again um, acknowledge these two uh, luminaries in Minnesota. I think I'll First, introduce Mr. Shelby, a dear friend of mine, uh, literally one of the most recognizable faces and one of the most beloved personalities in all of Minnesota, is no hyperbole, to say Don Shelby uh, has uh, had a very special interest in the environment and energy and ecology in his 32 years as an anchor on WCCO, uh, both as an investigative reporter and environmental journalist. Um, uh, ten years as a radio personality on WCCO AM. He's won over many numerous professional awards and twice won the George Foster Peabody Award. He's also a member of an international association of climate scientists who team up with media personalities to respond to attacks on science. So he has a deep passion in that subject. And he serves on the board of directors of Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, who are our lawyers in a lot of the policy work that we do. 
And I'll just uh, give this one little plug is people might not remember this, but uh, WCC energy, uh, used to do special energy segments. And Don had this crazy idea that viewers were interested in energy stories. And he convinced, WC, uh, he convinced WCCO's management and then CBS National that let's do some energy stories. And after he persuaded them, they were like, energy stories, nobody wants to watch energy stories on the evening news, Don. <laughs> and after he convinced them that he was going to do energy stories, their ratings doubled, and they, they doubled over all the other competitors. And he did 800 stories on energy, <laughs> and a, pro a, a program he called Project Energy, 800 stories. I think they're available on DVD, right? <laughs> like, get, collect them all. <laughs> so, um, also, uh, Sean Otto is also a dear friend. Um, people don't know this, but Sean Otto is the uh, founder of uh, and producer of a, a national nonprofit that's been um, for the last few cycles been pressing the presidential debate that we should have a debate in the presidential debate just on scientific questions. That I think is a very big important idea and hopefully this will be the year we strike gold on that. I remember being in this room, I think it was 2011, when he uh, uh, released his first, first book, which was actually on the same, not his first book, but his first book on this topic, first nonfiction book. It was called Fool Me Twice, and it was the 2012 winner of the Minnesota Book Award, a really a great book on the subject of science and integrity in, in politics and public policy. So he is, um, for this book uh, that we're going to talk about tonight, is the recipient of the IEEE Distinguished uh, public Service Award for this work. The IEEE is the uh, Association of Engineers and Electrical Engineering. Uh, is that right? It's close, right? It's pretty close. There's three E's and two of them are engineer, I think. What is it? Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. The Electrical and Electronic guy. Engineers. Excuse me on that. So he also, you might know, uh, he uh, is an Academy Award winner for his screenplay, uh, House of Sand and Fog. And uh, his first novel, Sins of Our Fathers, is a, is a thriller, a Minnesota literary thriller, which you might read if you haven't read. He's widely published in magazines like the Rolling Stone, Science Magazine, Scientific American. He lives here in Marina St. Croix with his beloved wife, Rebecca Otto, who's our state auditor. So with that, let's have Don Shelby, Sean Otto. Welcome. Thank you very much, Michael, for that introduction. You read uh, my biography exactly as I wrote it, and I thank you <laughs> for reminding people in the audience who I am. Uh, retiring in 2010, I was so worried that uh, I wouldn't have anything to do. And uh, those people who are retired in the audience know that that's absolutely false, that you uh, end up working uh, twice as many hours as you normally had planned. I thought retirement would be fishing in hammocks and uh, it's a far, far cry from that. Uh, I've known uh, Sean uh, since the beginning of the uh, book Fool Me Twice, which I said at the time was one of the uh, most important books written in the uh, in this 20th century at that time, 21st century. That uh, everyone should read it. And then uh, I picked up this book and read it and was floored by facts so well established by uh, Sean that it became shocking to me. Though the facts were well known to me, it was shocking the way he uh, put it in context. And so uh, my hope is that this book reaches every reader in America because as an investigative reporter most of my life it seems what you've done is an investigation and the investigation uh, results in knowledge from which people can't escape and once the American public realizes they have been worked 
no matter what their political or ideological positions are, once they realize they have been worked by forces into holding beliefs that may not be true, then I think that they're going to rebel and I think things are going to change. But I want to ask you uh, from the beginning, why science? What about science made you uh, want to delve into these issues? You're not a scientist. That's right. No, I'm not. But I'm a very concerned citizen. And to me, uh, science is the foundation of democracy. Um, Michael talked about that, that Moynihan quote, uh, how you're entitled to your own opinion but not your own facts, and that's in some ways a, at the crux of what we're talking about. Uh, science is the great equalizer in democracy. There are powerful vested interests in any society. Science is the one thing that stands between the individual citizen and those powerful vested interests because it says this is evidence from nature, from the one universal that we can't argue with because we can go back through a certain process of reason and establish what's true and what's not. And that evidence is the surest foundation for a fair and equitable public policy. So if you care about economic justice, or if you care about racial justice, or if you care about environmental justice, or if you care about criminal justice, you've got to care about science and evidence as a foundation for that justice. But if we're to have a informed public policy, and we look at the 535 members of Congress, the upper and lower bodies of Congress, Senate and the House, it is a dismally, almost infinitesimal fraction of that body that has representatives from the world of science who understand the scientific method, who respect fact, the observable truth. Yeah, that's right. Uh, right now it's hovering around 1%. Um, now that's not necessarily uh, a bad thing uh, if all those members have access to good science advisors and good scientific advice and if there are not overwhelming forces pushing the other way uh, on policymakers to move them away from that science. Unfortunately, Congress uh, uh, several years ago now defunded their science advisory body, the nonpartisan Office of Technology Assessment. And that's what they used to use to generate nonpartisan rapid scientific advice uh, in, in their bills. Uh, so now members more often than not rely on the internet uh, or lobbyists, both of which of course are always tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well let's delve into the book a little bit. Um, the history of the war on science. Uh, for those people assembled in this room would presume that the war on science is denialism, uh, the uh, Bush administration lunch memo, how to counteract uh, the, the thought of possible intervention by government in mandating certain changes. But the war on science if, my, if I understand your book correctly and if my reading of history is correct, began an awfully long time ago. Can you give us a brief history of the continuing war on science? Well, sure, yeah. There, I mean, you can trace the foundation or the roots of the war on science uh, to the beginning of the scientific revolution, really. Uh, and science really grew out of religion and law. And uh, the early... Uh, leaders of the scientific revolution, people like Francis Bacon, were also lawyers. Uh, and uh, in, in England were Puritans, uh, a sect of Protestantism, uh, that were really focused on establishing the truth of nature, God's interpretation of, of law, uh, by observing nature and creating a set of of principles that was based on that to discern what God would want and it was called natural philosophy. And the natural philosophers uh, expanded across Europe uh, and really the war on science 
erupted most famously early on when Galileo looked through a telescope that he'd made and he said it looks like Copernicus was right there seems to be uh, shadows up there and 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 it looks like uh, the earth is actually going around the Sun and not the other way around uh, as soon as that happened uh, he was butting up against the vested interests of the then most powerful uh, economic and political force in the world which was the Catholic Church uh, and he was challenging their origin story and as soon as he did that, uh, a war on science erupted, really. There was a lot of debate about Galileo, and members of the clergy refused to even look through his telescope. We've had that kind of, of push and pull between powerful vested interests uh, whose uh, ideological foundation or whose economic foundation is threatened by new knowledge from science fighting back against that new knowledge and against those scientists since then. Galileo was indicted and later imprisoned uh, and climate scientists today are under equal attack in many times uh, by today's vested uh, seat of world power which is really the US energy industry. So we know that uh, Galileo um, face this uh, incredible term in your book and it's a, a term that uh, I uh, quite frankly have stolen in every one of my speeches but uh, the word is authority and all new knowledge you postulate all new knowledge from science is anti-authoritarian that each new piece of information shakes the foundations of those mature uh, authorities that hold uh, the power in our society. That's right. And could you tell us more about the anti-authoritarian nature of science? Sure, yeah. Well, science takes nothing on faith. Uh, it says, show me the evidence and I will determine for myself based on that evidence if what you say is true. Uh, I don't have to base it on what an authority tells me. Um, the way that the process often works is um, new science is quickly commercialized. Let's say uh, the internal combustion engine which was uh, created from some science and some technology and some tinkering, engineering. And, uh, and new economies are built on that. Uh, it's quickly moved into the market. Lots of people make money. Then uh, time moves on and the creatively disruptive force of science continues and it continues to create new knowledge and that new knowledge uh, very often then disrupts uh, industry that has grown up based on older science. Uh, so there's a continual process of creative destruction that happens uh, and that uh, generally places science in the crosshairs of, of people who have built industries on old technology or old science. Now we're going to get into climate denialism and, and some of the uh, powerful effects, particularly in money and in campaign financing and in uh, 401c4 programs, yeah. dark money and things like that. And, and we'll talk about that. But for the non-scientists in the audience and, and for those people watching uh, on our stream, explain the scientific process and how it differs from just forming opinions. How does the scientific method work? Sure. Well, this goes back to, again, kind of that early time when science was emerging from religion. And there were a lot of thinkers around that time. Francis Bacon was one of them. Another one of them that Thomas Jefferson always included with Bacon and Newton in his trinity of three greatest men, he said, uh, was John Locke. A uh, lot of conservatives uh, like John Locke, and there's a lot of talk about John Locke these days. And one thing that John Locke was known for uh, is that he looked around and he saw all these different sects of Protest Protestantism arguing with one another. And let me back up for just one minute and tell you just kind of a, a story that feeds into that. Is that all right? Yes. So the printing press uh, enabled Martin Luther uh, to really rise to power with an alternative to the Catholic Church. He translated the Bible into German and he said, you don't have to take the word of the Pope or those priests, uh, you can read it for yourself. 
And that really had an effect of splitting Western thought into two different parallel strains, the authoritarian, top-down strain of thought, and the anti-authoritarian, look-at-it-for-yourself strain of thought, out of which science and Western democracy, it could be argued, really grew. But moving forward again, then, with this idea of these two strains of thought, uh, Protestantism, sort of like the Democratic Party, continued to split into smaller and smaller, smaller warring factions, <laughs> none of them agreeing with each other. And John Locke looked around at this mess at the time and he said, each of these different sects uh, claim that they have the true path to God. There must be some way to discern who's right. And he came up with a test uh, to determine what is knowledge and how is that separate from opinion. And, it, and the test had three different components. There was intuitive knowledge, something like I can show you with these four apples that two plus two equals four. You look at it, it's intuitively correct, right? You can't argue with it. Then there's demonstrative knowledge. Uh, I can show you with this vacuum tube that, you know, if I drop a penny and a feather, they, they fall at different rates, but if I suck all the air out, they fall at the same rate. So by controlling that one variable, I can make a statement about that variable, uh, that it has an effect on, the, on gravity and on the way that things pass through air. So that I demonstrated that. And then there's sensitive knowledge, uh, which gets into, oh, I smell a rose. There must be a rose around here somewhere, a rose bush. But he said that sensitive knowledge is actually the least reliable, or common sense, the least reliable form of knowledge because we're easily fooled because I might be smelling perfume or something else that smells like a rose. So based on this thinking uh, and the thinking of some prominent Islamic scholars, uh, people like uh, Francis Bacon determined a process of going out, observing nature, making a prediction, a risky prediction, uh, that a test could either prove is correct or more likely, not prove is correct, that a test could either prove is incorrect uh, or more likely uh, say that it is probably true. Uh, and then publishing those results, uh, letting others then try to tear them down uh, and the process repeats. And in this way, by making these observations, going back to demonstrative or intuitive knowledge, uh, controlling a variable like I described in the vacuum tube, we can slowly build awareness and information about the true nature of reality instead of what we confuse ourselves with all the time in our perceptions. So is there a point at which we arrive at a notion that there is an observable, objective truth? Is there objective truth? There is, and that's something that uh, we often get wrong these days. Uh, and as you know, uh, because I know you've done a lot of work trying to educate the news media about uh, aspects of this question. It's, it's very complex, but for the last two generations, journalists, educators, uh, and others have been taught that there is no such thing as objectivity. Uh, and that came out of a, a reaction to science and particularly to uh, the way that science had been used in World War II and in the run-up to World War II. Uh, and that school of thought was called postmodernism, essentially. And it said that science was just one of many ways of knowing. And it had no greater or lesser authority than any other way of knowing it. And uh, in fact, it wasn't objective. It was just a, a, an equal footing with anything else. But what science tries to do is strip what is true regardless of your racial identity, your sexual identity, your religious identity, your political identity, all of those different sources of bias because it relies on, again, that form of knowledge that ties back to nature, not to who we are. And then it says, anybody else, please test this, see if it's true for you too. The falsifiability. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Now. If we believe then that there is objective truth in postmodernist theory, 
uh, that everyone brings to the table their own form of truth. Some valuable things, I think, probably have come out of that in terms of uh, social benefits. Absolutely. Because we can look at others' experiences and they may say, this is my truth, and it may not be your truth. Uh, and it's difficult for one to look at their experience in uh, South Sudan or Somalia or uh, in Tanzania or South America and say, no, that's not the truth. You don't have the truth. They have witnessed a certain kind of truth. But you uh, continually cite throughout this book, I think it's uh, either Roger Bacon or Francis Bacon, that uh, it, it's but faith or opinion. Right, but yeah. faith or opinion, because anything that is not observable, replicable, in terms of the scientific method, is but faith or opinion. Right. Speak to that issue. Talk about faith and opinion and how it affects our thinking about current issues mm -hmm. and history. Yeah. Well, that, that was John Locke, actually, and he said John that Locke. whatever fails these three tests, uh, however essentially, I'm paraphrasing, however forcefully argued or articulated is still but faith or opinion, but not knowledge in the true sense of what we mean by the word knowledge. So what he was getting at was that yes, people have their their own personal experiences of the world and their own uh, opinions about those experiences and those are are, are valid in the class of faith and opinion, but knowledge is what is reliable uh, for all of us and what is universal no matter who does the measuring. Uh, it's always going to be the same distance between Minneapolis and Dallas no matter whether you drive it or I drive it or somebody else drives it, unless somebody's been messing with our odometers. But, but um, uh, there are certain objective uh, facts that are independent of our subjective identity status. And what is happening is that science is advancing to claim more or to cr have created more and more knowledge about reality. So there is a greater and greater input into public policy decisions from objective knowledge from science. And where we get into trouble, and I know you've done a lot of work in this, is when uh, journalists who have been taught, and in some ways rightfully so, the cautionary teaching that there is no such thing as objectivity. In other words, don't pose as if you are an objective journalist because you bring your own implicit biases to this conversation. And if you don't acknowledge them, you may fall victim to them and that affects your reporting. That's a important and noble perspective, but where that gets into trouble is when, in, when something that they are reporting on has a large knowledge input from science. And you've talked, I think, considerably about false balance. Uh, and you could, you know, I'd like it if you'd describe for the audience what that is, because you're far more articulate on that than I am, I think. Well, the false balance that, that I uh, kept seeing is, is something that came to me very clearly in an interview that I did uh, last month with Bill Moyers. He uh, is fond of saying that journalists are generalists uh, with no specific uh, skill set in areas of diplomacy or science. They're generalists who are tasked and licensed with the responsibility of explaining things they have uh, cannot understand to other people. And, uh, and that's important to remember because it is absolutely true that, that, uh, that un un unless journalists uh, can uh, somehow uh, pick a, a subject and a beat area and just stay in there, but because of the, uh, the problems getting worse, it used to be, there used to be science reporters, there used to be uh, people who just did politics, there used to be people, but now uh, because of the uh, financial uh, situation and, and the uh, explosion of media and uh, the amount of money going into these places, you can't hire as many of these people and you can't allow them to be anything but generalists. So what happens is a person who knows nothing about climate science, for instance, 
there is a uh, something in town that says uh, the University of Minnesota is putting on a a seminar on uh, climate change. Go cover that. And they don't know anything about climate change. So they go to and interview someone for 30 seconds who says there's uh, the science indicates that there is climate change and there is a discernible human influence, fossil fuels and, and land management. Then they feel compelled by the the three-legged stool of, of journalism to uh, accuracy, fairness, and balance. And they take balance way too far because they don't know the answer, so they go find someone else who, who disagrees to balance the report. So you find someone else who says, no, climate change is uh, not true. Very difficult to find scientists who will say that, so usually you end up going to an economist or or anybody who will just say, uh, no, it's not true. It's absolutely, you go to Rush Limbaugh and you talk to him for a while. Um, and, and then you put a story on the air that gives 30 seconds to this person and 30 seconds to this person. And the result is, and something I detest, the result is nil. Nothing has been accomplished mm -hmm. except to continue the idea that no one knows for sure. Right. When in fact, if you used a standard of preponderance of evidence as the balancing mechanism, that you see that most recent reports come in 97 to 98 percent of all published peer reviewed uh, scientists say that the science is, uh, is in, and the, the National Academy of Sciences has said that it's basically indisputable at this point, and only 3%, the actual balance would look like uh, 97 seconds of this person and 3 seconds of this other person, mm -hmm. which would not look like balance and you'd get called on the carpet because you didn't balance your report. That's false balance. And journalists should be in the position of trying to establish what is true. That's what right. they should be trying. Not, not saying there's a debate on either side. And, and, and not to take any more time, but uh, when, when I first, uh, the, the, I think the first Emmy I won was a, uh, a deep investigation into the sexual abuse of children. I didn't feel compelled to go out and find people who sexually abused children and give them equal time mm -hmm. to tell me the upside of the sexual abuse of children. Yeah. It didn't because that was the intuitive knowledge that there, there was a wrong that was occurring mm -hmm. and there was an established factual mm -hmm. wrong that was occurring. And nothing they could say <laughs> would really make so it right. That's a really interesting comparison then because the sexual abuse of children that's obviously wrong uh, and the moral outrage should be similar for the overall destruction of the planet yeah, and the de deprivation of the opportunity for life and prosperity for children. And yet somehow we don't make that connection and we've allowed ourselves to become confused uh, and there is a moral uh, issue I think in play there. Um, and I don't know if you have, have thought about that, but I, I love your approach, and I quoted it in the book actually about true balance is you balance a story by telling the side of the story that has the weight of all the evidence. You treat it like a set of scales. And what happens, what I've seen happen over the years that I've been uh, working in this area is that the false balance winds up skewing our political dialogue towards extreme views because it gives unequal time, really, undeserved time to people with contrarian, anti-science extreme views who nevertheless are generally far more charismatic and articulate than the scientists that are representing uh, the, the mainstream information. Why? Because they're impassioned to convince you of the truth of their argument, whereas the scientists uh, that is death to a scientist. You don't try to c convince people of the truth of your argument. I think you're um, one of the most important points that you make, and I hope scientists spend time reading and absorbing the lessons of this book, is that they are terrible. 
They are absolutely terrible. There, there are a few outstanding ones, that, and there have been some great ones. Carl Sagan was a great one. Hubble was a great one. To be able to communicate with people and talk with people about these, these scientific uh, constructs. But most scientists have, and, and, and this is something you'll learn if you read the book, that there was a period of time when scientists did have to go to the public and kind of make their case and communicate and explain science to people and, and get them on their side because that's where the funding was coming from. But when government took over the funding, then they became cloistered and only talked to themselves. They didn't have to talk to the public anymore. That's right. yeah. And that line of communication was broken. So, so a lot of this problem we're in does fall uh, at the feet of scientists for their failure to speak to the public. That's right, and I think it was an unintended consequence of, of the creation of the National Science Foundation and our other government uh, science-granting entities. Um, because you had to, if you're going to start doling out money to scientists, as we decided to do then, uh, largely after Sputnik, uh, and people were motivated thinking, oh, geez, we're going to have to... You know, we're, we, we could be taken over here by the Russians. Uh, so we better invest in science. So there's a science race and a space race that that, that initiated. Uh, and the NSF was finally fully funded. It had been an idea that had been proposed since, the, uh, since World War II, but it took 12 years to fund it, and Sputnik was a political motivation. Uh, you've probably heard Obama talking about a Sputnik moment. That was it. Uh, so you got all this government money suddenly funding peacetime in investigation into science and the idea was that it would make America an international superpower and in fact it did but then how do you responsibly spend that money well you gotta set up panels of scientifically literate people probably other scientists that judge these grant applications to see which ones are good and which ones aren't which because you would have a scandal if you didn't have some kind of standards so that was all good, but they made a mistake because they didn't require public outreach anymore. And it made it much more convenient and much more efficient, but in a democracy, the public conversation is essential. That buy-in is part of our feedback mechanism for self-governance. And science is at the center of that, and it always has been. Thomas Jefferson was a scientist. In his first State of the Union address, George Washington talked about the importance of science. These people were steeped in it, and in, in its essential importance in the public making good decisions. And by breaking that connection, as we did unintentionally, uh, we set up the conditions for this to really prosper in the United States. All right, now we're going to get to the nub of the matter. And uh, this pits uh, scientists against those people who would wage war on them. They are often uh, hesitant, recalcitrant on uh, the idea of speaking out for fear that they will seem political. That's right. But your argument is that science has always been and will always be political. Yes, absolutely. Explain that. It's, uh, the, I, I like to say science is never partisan, but it's always political. And the reason that it's political is that, as Francis Bacon said, knowledge creates power. Well, what creates knowledge? Science. That's our tool. That's our method that humanity has created for creating knowledge. So, and that power enables us to do things in the physical world. That knowledge either confirms or challenges vested interests. And so it is always inherently and implicitly political. It's always going to have an impact on somebody. So we would do well as scientists and those who support science to acknowledge that and embrace that political component. That is a very different thing than a partisan component. Science is neither left nor right, but it is actually both conservative and progressive. 
a scientist is not going to stick his or her neck out and publish on something unless they've researched all the papers that have been published on that topic before to make certain that they are not an outlier, they're not, that there isn't something that they are repeating in a, in a way that is unfounded. Uh, because that's a quick way to end your career. But at the same time, they're always going to be open to new information and to be out on the edge because that's where career advancement happens. That's where the new discoveries are. So both left and right, both progressive and conservative. But what's going on in America right now, and what we're actually seeing, I would argue, going on in the Republican Party at its focus right now, is a very different divide, which is the authoritarian, anti-authoritarian, a top-down, not a left-right, but a top-down argument. Uh, and that is uh, an argument that we have had a hard time getting our minds around because you can be conservative but anti-authoritarian and embrace science. We used to call those people moderate Republicans, right? <laughs> Um, or you can be progressive and anti-authoritarian and embrace science. We used to call those people progressives or greens, but now most, because of the top-down argument, most Democrats have moved into that corner. Uh, a lot of moderate Republicans are feeling like they are without a home, uh, and much of the uh, argument that is right now threatening to destroy the Republican Party is an argument over authoritarianism. Now we've talked about conservatives and uh, we uh, sometimes make the conservatives the, the boogeyman in uh, uh, horror stories we tell our children about climate change. <laughs> and, uh, and it's well earned. Uh, it's well earned, and, and I'm, I'm not here to dispel that. But I think it's very interesting that in your book you point out that it's not the uh, sole province of conservatives to be anti-science, that there are well-established cases of liberal Democrats mm -hmm. who are also anti-science, which many in this room may find perfectly reasonable. Yeah, that's, that's right. Well, something funny happened around 1962 uh, with the publication of uh, Silent Spring. Uh, and, you know, we had developed through uh, Defense Department spending a lot of pesticides in World War II for protecting soldiers, keep, keeping malaria down in, in the Philippines and in other Pacific islands. And so we developed this thing called DDT and uh, a number of other uh, chemical uh, advances uh, that then were quickly rushed into through the military industrial complex, really, wanting to keep their, their profit cycle going, were quickly rushed into broad commercial applications. Uh, uh, and this led to a lot of positive things uh, after World War II, but it also had a, some unintended consequences that Rachel Carson really brought to light in, with the publication of that book. That was the, really the birth of environmental science and the birth of the modern environmental movement. Uh, but what that did is that pitted old industry, particularly in the petrochemical and the chemical agro, agrochemical industry, against new environmental scientists and, and by extension mainstream science because the American Association for the Advancement of Science, National Academies, all of them were saying that yeah this is, this is an issue as well as the government scientists of which Rachel Carson, Carson was one. Uh, so we saw a, a divide happen that began to redefine American politics at that moment uh, into the political party structure that we uh, sort of could recognize if we think about it today with with oil and old industry on one side and scientists and environmentalists on the other. Then about 10 years later uh, the advances in uh, reproductive medicine, women's reproductive health, the pill, uh, all kinds of, of new advances and understandings about when life began uh, begins began to um, offend religious conservatives. Uh, so they peeled off. So then we saw this kind of alignment where 
fundamentalists became the foot soldiers for the oil industry. Uh, and uh, that kind of formed the nexus of a shift that became the modern Republican Party. And on the left, uh, we saw the ideas about the dangers, the hidden dangers to our health and to the environment um, be, begin to be extended in ways that weren't supported by science. Now it's sure uh, they, people on the left have a lot of good reason for suspecting uh, corporations uh, that commercialize these uh, chemicals and put them into the environment. Um, but that doesn't mean that, they, that everything uh, is a danger. And so where uh, liberals get into trouble is uh, around this idea of hidden dangers to health and the environment. That the idea that cell phones uh, cause brain cancer. They don't. I'll just tell you, everybody, you can feel safe. It's physically impossible for your cell phone to cause brain cancer. Vaccines. That vaccines cause autism. They don't. There's no science whatsoever that supports that. It, millions and millions of people have been studied now, and we have not been able to find any correlation whatsoever. That genetic modified food is uh, unsafe to eat. It's not. Genetic modification is not an ingredient that is added to food. It's not a chemical. It's just a more precise way of plant breeding. In fact, you can take plants and you can soak them in carcin carcinogenic chemicals and you can bombard them with radiation. That's a, they're seeds. That's a process called mutagenesis in order to try to get them to change into something else. And then you can plant that and you can call it organic. <laughs> so people are easily confused about uh, about be, because of the technical advances in science. Uh, and so where, where those of us on the liberal side of things need to be careful is to embrace the reason and not fall into the same kind of knee-jerk rejection of science around uh, issues that, uh, that our friends on the conservative side do. All right, now let's get into, because I, how much time do we have? We have... Uh, Ten minutes in this discussion, so I want to focus uh, on today, and I want to talk about climate science and the concerted effort by the fossil fuel industries, the American Pot Petroleum Institute, uh, the various uh, dark money groups that have poured so much money into keeping America confused. I, I use the keeping American confused because it was part uh, of the Luntz memo in the uh, George W. Bush administration on how how to respond to the ever-increasing knowledge it was the the recommendation by Luntz even though he is now uh, a complete believer in the science said then if you want to not do anything just keep them confused the American people and make them believe that there is a debate still and the facts are not in. So you've tracked the money. You know where it's coming from. You know how much money is going in from K Street. K Street is shorthand language for people who covered Washington for where all of the lobbyists live and have their offices. Uh, the amount of money that is reaching Congress and influencing votes uh, let's just talk about that, that it's, because it is a morass and it is frightening and I think that if this were told to the American people, if they knew they were being worked, as I uh, open my statements, then uh, things would change very rapidly. So let's talk about that for the next 10 minutes. Yeah. Well, that is a very concerted effort to short-circuit democracy and the democratic process, to stop or forestall regulations that industry doesn't like, particularly the petrochemical, oil, coal, natural gas, and energy uh, industries. And if you've got a couple of trillion dollars of hydrocarbons left in the ground, it's a cheap investment to spend about a billion dollars a year, which is about what they're spending, to lobby Congress and to set up fake grassroots organizations 
and fake scientific journals that disseminate fake information to create what the American Petroleum Institute and others uh, who develop public relations campaigns on this call uncertainties about the science. And this is a long-standing public relations strategy that I track in the book uh, that goes back well be before the climate change issue to other issues where industry wanted to forestall regulations. Uh, and the strategy is to create uncertainty. Like, and then someone can argue, like for instance Sarah Palin does, that let's have a debate about it because debate is so healthy. Uh, but the problem with that is, is that if there is significant scientific certainty, having a debate about it is just another form of false balance that again empowers the anti-science forces. So we see a lot of investment going on uh, aimed at Congress but a lot just aimed at the public. I'll give you one example. So shortly after he was elected, President Obama, just as a matter of a couple of months, in March after he took office, and I think in late January, early February, in March, he had his first uh, uh, address to Congress, and he asked Congress to send him a cap and trade bill. Uh, a few months after that, the House complied with eight Republican votes, passed this cap and trade bill. This is 2008, 2009, 2009. Um, the Senate didn't take it up at that point in time, um, and there was a lot of political reasons for that. Uh, the 2010 elections were coming up, people were nervous about it. Obama was a new president, and he kind of felt like he needed to push in two different areas. He had a very ambitious policy agenda, Obamacare, healthcare, and climate. Those are his two big signature uh, bills that he wanted to get done. He uh, became convinced that uh, he had to put his energy into something that would have the more immediate impact on people, which was health care. And that left an opening. Uh, and uh, Americans for Prosperity, Tim Phillips, their executive director, even has you know, talked about this many times, about how he took advantage of that opening. Um, they're funded largely by the Koch brothers. Uh, and they went around uh, and they uh, campaigned in uh, states where senators uh, had competitive races. Uh, they had got a hot air balloon that's, and, and they ran TV commercials and they showed that um, in these commercials they argued that cap and trade would cost American jobs. Uh, at the same time, uh, they and, and groups like the Competitive Enterprise Institute, all working in somewhat in a coordinated fashion, uh, testified in Congress with fake experts uh, and sent people out uh, into the communities to influence thought talking to rotary groups and to uh, uh, other professional associations so that members of Congress started hearing this uh, back from their constituents back home also that they didn't want anything to do with cap and trade. It was very targeted in just a number of races. And then they invested big money in mounting Tea Party primary opponents against those eight House members and a few others and they knocked most of them out in primary battles. Uh, and by people who are even further right. And that really put the fear of God in the senators. And you saw the Senate uh, suddenly saying that they did not have the votes. And this was a Democratic Senate, that they didn't have the votes to support cap and trade. So it was really a remarkable accomplishment of politics and coordinated public relations. And for an investment of less than, a, it was about $480 million uh, by my count that they spent on their direct efforts there. They altered the course of American history on, on a president's major bill. I may have this wrong, but uh, I think it's the uh, GCSCP, the uh, Global Climate Science Communication Plan. Yes. Uh, tell me ab about that and, and who was a part of it and how it is working because it is working and it has been working because as long as we see these numbers divided about those people who believe that uh, global warming and climate change is a uh, a problem still is is split out there yeah it's growing but it's still split because there are people who absolutely do not believe it and people who do believe it but uh, the 
the ones who don't believe it are are getting their information from the people who formulated this communications plan. Yes, and uh, I call the, the 12 people that met in that secret meeting the 12 apostles of, of climate denial. And they uh, included representatives from Exxon, uh, from the American Petroleum Institute, uh, from uh, uh, Southern Energy, uh, from m the usual suspects that you would suspect, large businesses that had vested interests in trying to stop uh, climate science uh, uh, and regulation based on it. And this was back in the 1990s. Uh, so this was not something that was brand new. I mean, that, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, in 1988, James Hansen testified before Congress. Uh, he was the head of NASA Goddard talking about uh, climate change and how it's real. And we can play in the news for a number of years. Rebecca and I, you know, when our son, who's at that camera right there, uh, when he came along, uh, we decided that we were concerned enough about the future that we were going to, we're building a house and that we were going to do it ourselves and we were going to make sure that it was super insulated, earth burned, airtight, geothermal, wind powered, passive solar, because we didn't want to be contributing to the problem. We didn't think it was responsible. That was 1995. And here we are over 20 years later now, 20, 21 years later, and we're still having debates in, in politics and in the media about whether or not it's real. You know, we're in a situation where Leonardo DiCaprio has to use his, his Oscar speech in order to talk about the reality of climate change so that people hear about it in the media. And the week following the International Paris Climate Accord, where 195 countries came together to begin to remake the global economy and get us off carbon, there was a Republican presidential debate and there was a Democratic presidential debate, and the journalists asked not one question about climate. Uh, we're going to wrap up now, and this is a good place to wrap it up because He's just given you uh, just a sampling of what is said in this book. It is very, very deep and very, very well articulated, and it's an incredible investigation. Uh, and you'll be rewarded by reading this, and you'll be changed when you read this book. You will be changed because you will realize what has been happening. Uh, in this discussion and why there is still uh, in our communities around the country uh, some notion that there is a debate of whether climate change is real or not and why scientists have uh, been uh, treated uh, so so badly I think so shabbily in in this uh, in at least the last 20 years but, but the final thing before we open up for questions and, and, and do this in one minute. If it is a war, if it is a war on science, and you are the general commanding the troops <laughs> for science, what is your strategy? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> but... It'll take longer than a minute, so you're going to have to read the book. <laughs> but the book does contain 12 battle plans, is what I call them, uh, of what individuals can do personally, what they can do to change or put pressure on uh, the structural problems that are helping enable this uh, from uh, media outlets to uh, elected officials to uh, our structural political system uh, and how they uh, which groups uh, like fresh energy are on the forefront of this battle and what uh, how, how to support them and how through supporting for instance the organization that I co-founded sciencedebate.org you know go on there sign up add your name to the call for the candidates, not just candidates for president, but candidates to talk about this. Because if we can, if we can bring politicians together with media, the scientists, and the public, we can really begin to transform this conversation. And in an age when science is influencing every aspect of life, we need to find a new way of incorporating in our conversation. Done.
John Lawrence Otto. like to briefly um, let everyone know that Sean will be available after the 10-minute Q&A signing books. Books are also available for sale if you uh, did not see that on your way in, so please stick around. Um, but my lovely helper here, Daly, and I will be walking around the room to answer questions. Again, we have about 10 minutes to do so. Um, let's get started. Um, before the first question, I would just like to point out that my eighth grade English teacher, Cindy Callan, is sitting right over here. <laughs> Questions? Are you ready? Yes. Sean, could you tell us more about the battle plans? 14 uh, segments that uh, I think are really profound. Uh, please tell us more. This is much on much more than climate change. Oh yes, absolutely. Really, I mean, this is the, the problem as we've begun to get into is that science is growing so advanced that it becomes difficult for not just journalists, but for all of us, uh, even scientists, to really understand things uh, in a general sense. How do you know what is true and what is not true? Uh, what to believe? And that's, that's really what a lot of society is struggling with in the age of the internet here. So one of the battle plans, for instance, talks about mechanisms that we can put in place to do a better job of, of making scientific information first of all verifiable and second of all available to the public. Now there are a lot of problems in science itself that need to be dealt with uh, like the verifiability question for instance uh, which you may have heard about in the media recently how there's really not an incentive uh, in our, in our uh, science funding structure for people to go out and repeat work that others have done and say Say, yeah, that is true. Uh, so we can run into problems where scientists are encouraged to publish uh, just to make a splash and to get that extra grant funding uh, or, or get, uh, you know, get their lab continuing uh, to move forward. Uh, and you're not going to do that by just saying that what some other scientists said seems to be supported. So we need, so there, there are a lot, there are some structural things like that that I think that are very interesting for conversation uh, with people that work in uh, academia or in science fields or in government granting bodies or in nonprofits. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, battle plans that have to do with our own personal conduct, too. And working into our party platform. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Working into the party platform as well. Thank you. Yes. Sean, my question is about the internet. Um, with the exponential growth of the internet, is there an exponential rise in the war on science? Yes, there is. Well, part of that is tied into uh, all of us uh, being able to get the kind of news that just reconfirms our pre-existing worldview, confirmation bias, it's called, uh, which is something that scientists are trained to hopefully guard against, but uh, which is um, uh, something that's become a significant problem in the fracturing of our news media that Don talked about. Uh, it used to be that we went to, you know, two or three maybe four different networks in broadcast television and they were our authoritarian source of news and now there are hundreds and we can just go on Facebook and pick out the stories that our friends like and the chances are we'll like them and we won't even see the offensive stuff that we don't like and pretty soon we're thinking along one narrow track and we're not exposed to ideas that are different than ours. Uh, so we see a kind of a fragmenting and fracturing of society, not along geographic lines, but along intellectual and ideological lines. So that's part of it. Another part of it is just the advancement in the creation of knowledge itself that the internet is, is causing. Uh, scientists can collaborate over the internet, and there are more of them working now than at any time in history. So over the next 40 years, we're expected to make as, new, as much new knowledge as we have since the beginning of the scientific revolution. So if you think about some of the really disruptive uh, technologies or, or insights or the politically disruptive conversations about when life begins, 
boy, we're in for a rocky ride. There's a lot more of them coming, particularly as we integrate computer science with neuroscience, as we learn to uh, design uh, uh, living organisms, uh, and uh, we master gene editing, There's a, and perhaps uh, extend life uh, for another hundred years. I mean, there are a lot of moral and ethical issues uh, that are just on the surface. Those of you in the in the audience who are attorneys um, uh, are probably going to be really dealing with and fascinated by, I assume, all the issues around free will that neuroscience is beginning to present and, and agency and uh, how are we responsible for our actions. Uh, so anyway, I think that there's a lot coming down the pike and we do need to find a new mechanism and that's part of what the book is about. Thanks, Sean, uh, for uh, a very important uh, uh, book and, and, and piece of knowledge. Uh, one of the things that I, I don't know if it's a question or a, I mean, I don't know how to ask it. Uh, most of the scientists are great uh, individuals. Um, and I'm sure there are quite a few uh, of them in this room. Uh, the problem that I see is that many of us are really, really sharp and, and very smart in, in our own fields, but how do we play as a team? And this, I mean, we have many Michael Jordan kinds of, of scientists uh, in this world, but uh, unfortunately when it comes to legislation, uh, at least from what I can see, uh, it has completely failed the public and, the, and, and democracy as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's where uh, I don't know how to participate in that in that field. It's a, it's a difficult thing because uh, the way that our uh, science funding is structured, um, it's difficult to engage, especially for nonprofits, in anything that appears to be political. Uh, and much of science is funded through kind of nonprofit vehicles or through government funding. Uh, you, for instance, will never see um, the National Science Foundation um, uh, supporting science debate because they can't, because it could be perceived by Congress as self dealing, even though it's nonpartisan and it's about encouraging a conversation. So we have some structural issues that we have to work out and the book explores some of those uh, but I think that the conversation has to happen on a policy level about how we fund the, uh, fund mechanisms for incorporating scientific information into our policy making process. Hi Sean. Yes. Uh, speaking as a Democrat, uh, I think we Democrats have difficulty in responding to some kind of uh, two arguments on the other side that I think are ridiculous. But where I think we're really bad, uh, in particular, is responding in a theological or religious way. In other words, fighting fire with fire. Do you think there's any uh, merit to being able to make an argument not only on a scientific term, but as an adjunct with uh, philosophical or religious uh, perspectives? Absolutely. I think that actually that's one of the probably more effective ways to make an argument. Um, there's a lot of science that shows that um, people uh, tend to use the same part of their brain and the same neuroprocesses for processing belief as they do for processing understanding of science. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we confuse ourselves easily and why it's so difficult sometimes for us to discern between what is uh, really true and what we believe to be true. Um, because we're using it would make sense if we were using the same brain system. Um, and generally that system is influenced by the perceived authority of the speaker. So there is a, a significant argument to be made for uh, particularly moral leaders, uh, people in the faith community, uh, priests, pastors, ministers, to be talking about these issues. And in fact, it used to be that churches were houses of moral and ethical reflection and scientific inquiry. Remember, science grew out of religion. And think about how exciting it could be to, for uh, members of the faith community if priests were actually members of the AAAS or the National Academies or, and, and were actually up on the science and were using that to help their parishioners navigate this extremely complex world we're living in and the moral and ethical components of it. Rather than this just simplistic, yes, climate change is happening, no, it's not, kind of argument. Uh, so I think that there's a tremendous opportunity there. 
Yes, absolutely. The Pope's encyclical had an enormous impact, and it was actually hilarious to see. Uh, there's footage of of climate deniers at the Heartland Institute's conference uh, trying to wrap their minds around what to do about the Pope uh, and his encyclical. Uh, it, it was it was terrific. Uh, I, I do want to say also that there that my partner on the stage here, um, you know, we had a conversation uh, downstairs. Um, yeah, talking about how he, he he was talking with Bill about how did, gosh you know this people are facts don't matter and and uh, he was talking with Bill Moyers about this and have I really have we wasted our careers if facts don't matter and I want to say that that uh, you do have enormous authority and that by using that authority as Michael talked about, to constructively communicate evidence, to explore topics like energy, and to convince the network to do that. That was an enormous public service, and I want to thank you for your commitment to evidence-based journalism. Ten minutes certainly flies by. I just want everyone to know this will be the last question of the Q&A segment, but like I said, Sean will be sticking around to sign books, so feel free to ask him questions uh, during that time. Is it, this, is a, excuse me. this is a heavy responsibility having the last question here, but I think this is really a question for both of you, and I know, Don, you mentioned the issue of the government uh, having, I guess, a somewhat negative influence on the scientific process uh, through the funding mechanism. One of the things that's happened over the last 30 years has been that the great industrial science labs have kind of quietly disappeared. I mean, there was Bell Labs, which was a terrific uh, resource for the country and the world, and there were a number of other uh, companies that had great uh, scientific laboratories that weren't really bought and paid for by the particular business that they're in. I wonder if either of you have any ideas of how we can get back to a, a kind of countervailing force on the scientific institutions that we have so it's not complete dependency on government on the one hand or complete dependency on the profit motive on the other. Yeah, well I think you hit the nail on the head with the profit motive there. In particular, uh, how we are approaching uh, business performance on a quarterly basis right now. And uh, it comes down in my mind uh, to leadership. There is uh, there's a generation of business leaders that went through World War II and that had a sense that we we're all in this together. And they funded long-range basic research labs and projects like that because they believed in the long horizon and they believed in the value of public service and community investment. And that the spin-offs from that kind of, of approach would be bountiful. And they were right. We have fallen into an approach that values the returns that we produce now. And we have also fallen into an approach where actually with many, many Minnesota corporate leaders uh, stepping outside of that, but broadly we've fallen into a very self-oriented approach among our corporate leadership. They are often not good citizens. And I think that that marks a, a change uh, in that, that attitude among our leaders. And that gets back to the moral and ethical discussion that we have to have around this. And I'm sure Don may have some other thoughts on that. I, just, I will say one thing uh, and, and hand the microphone very quickly back uh, to Sean to finish out this thing. but. Those people in uh, corporate and industrial laboratories doing science for profit, uh, being paid so that their uh, outcomes have been predecided, that we want you to do the science that will find this to be true, uh, so that our profits thereby will increase, or whatever someone is doing is wrong. Uh, 
this warms my heart as an investigative reporter because there are three attorneys general right now that are preparing huge lawsuits against ExxonMobil for having hidden the truth, not from the public, that they hid the truth from their investors, a violation of the SEC laws by those people who uh, in, the, in the 70s were telling, inside of ExxonMobil, were telling them, and also Shell, telling them that uh, fossil fuels were causing climate change. And this was well-established science even then. And yet they would go to the boardroom and they say, let's not tell the investors this. And now there are going to be lawsuits that will make the tobacco lawsuits pale by comparison because that will change everyone's behavior. I guess it, one last point about that corporate responsibility thing. Um, what is the purpose of a corporation? And that's an important question. Uh, is it strictly to make money? If that's the case, that is a kind of a sociopathic definition. Uh, a corporation like any business, my wife and I used to own a business, and our attitude, uh, and I'm going to promote it a little bit, is that the purpose of a business is to solve problems and make life better. And if you solve problems and make life better, you will have a customer base because you are adding value to their lives that's worth more to them than the money that they're going to give you. And if you apply that attitude, that also means that you're making life better for your community and you're solving problems for your community. You're making life better for your employees because you are providing an organization that they can work through to provide that service where they can put their skills to good use and have purpose in life and, and a way to make money and earn their bills so or pay their bills so this idea that a corporation is only about money i think is where we get into trouble that's too narrow of a definition because there is more to society than just economic exchanges and that's where we need to get back to Thank you all. Thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Mr. Don Shelby. Thank you.